you want to make sure that you control the exit. You know, you want to sell when it makes sense for you to sell. Um, and there are different strategies you can employ to do that. But that's one way you approach it. The other thing is, from a personal standpoint, you want to make sure you have the right insurance for yourself, the right life insurance. Um, and you should talk to your advisor so you understand your, your current situation. But as you learn more and more, you'll understand that there are more strategies that are open to you than maybe even your financial advisor is aware of. Welcome to the Share the Wealth Show, where minority professionals can learn to escape the racial wealth gap and catapult themselves into abundance. Your host, Nicole Pendergrass, grew her net worth from being negative to multiple six figures. Join her on her investigative mission to expose secret strategies of the wealthy so we can all have the tools needed to build the life and legacy we were created to possess. Now it's time for the show. Welcome back, everyone, to the Share the Wealth show. I am your host, Nicole Pendergrass, and today we have with us John Kasman. Now, you don't want to miss this episode. You really want to tune in because we went over his entire journey from him starting as a um, W-2 corporate employee and looking for a way to have more control over his income because he saw his job and his industry, the company he was working for, really like start to go bankrupt in the recession. And so from there, he found out about real estate and then he found like an unofficial mentor and basically working from going from two units to over a thousand units with partners. And you don't want to miss his insights, the information that he gives. John is a real estate entrepreneur, as you can tell from what I just said, he's in real estate um, and he's partnered with Disney professionals to invest in over a hundred million dollars worth of apartments. He also actively is a multifamily investors and he consults them to help them start and grow their business. He hosts the multifamily insights podcast, which was formerly target market insights. That is a great podcast, guys. If you have not listened to that Please tune in if you are interested in real estate at all. Multifamily Insights, John Kasman. And he's also the co-creator of the Midwest Real Estate Networking Summit. So prior to becoming a full-time investor, like I mentioned, he worked in corporate America, overseeing marketing campaigns for General Motors, Nike, and Coors Light. So this is an episode that's chock full of gems, information, and things that you really need to know. So don't miss it. Stay tuned. Here we go. Welcome everyone to another episode of the Share the Wealth Show. And I am here today with the infamous John Kasman. So John, welcome, welcome. And thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, Nicole, thank you for having me today. Infamous, that's the first time I've uh, heard that. So oh, I appreciate the first time. it. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. But I'm excited to be here and great to talk to you today. Oh, nice, nice. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. You have a hugely busy schedule, I'm sure. But this is great. So we're going to get to the point and let, you know, our listeners really get as much information as they can from you. So, okay. I gave a high level overview of your bio. Um, but to pare down on that, what do you think was maybe one of the most transitional, maybe pieces of information or action that you took that transitioned you from what you were doing before to what you're doing now? I mean, there are certainly a lot of steps that led to that transition. So I think at, uh, you know, anytime you're making those big changes, there are multiple things that that come into play. Um, but to give you one, um, you know, I attended a lot of events and spent a lot of time surrounding myself with other investors. And in particular, there was one investor who um, led one of the events. And I watched that investor go from a, a small portfolio, literally from three units to nine units. But then shortly after, they went from nine units to 90 units. And Whoa. that just, I mean, was awe inspiring. I, I didn't understand it. I couldn't fathom it. It didn't make any sense to me. I, I mean, the first month, I just assumed she must have came under, you know, came under like a, a big uh, inheritance check or something like that. Like, I don't know how else you would be able to grow like that. And finally, I just, I had to ask and I said, Hey, you know, I'd love to, you know, just sit down and, and learn how you did this. And I did that. And I think that was really pivotal because one, 
um, you don't get a chance to watch people grow right in front of you, but then two, to, to ask them directly, Hey, how did you do it? And to have them explain exactly what they did made it real for me. And it made it achievable and attainable for me. And that really changed the way I thought about real estate investing and how much we could scale and grow. Because up to that point, I was just saving my money. And then once we had enough money to buy a property, we would go out and look and see if we could find something. But you know, when I listened to how this person was able to grow their portfolio, it really allowed me to open up my thinking. Okay. So now two questions from that. First one, What made you even look at real estate? Like what led you to that real estate event or seminar? Well, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, like a lot of listeners, right? Um, It was a great book. It helped me think about money differently. Many people talk about how important real estate is in book, and it absolutely is. But there's actually something else that stood out to me in the book that I remember distinctly. And there's a part where he talks about you should work a job for skills, not just for a salary. And when you think about that, I was in corporate America doing advertising and marketing. I was at General Motors and uh, I was there from 2007 to 2011. So around late 2008 or really the middle of 2008, um, the market started to shift for our company. And in particular, I remember having our senior leadership, you know, vice presidents of finance, people I never spoke to reaching out saying, hey, did you sign that contract? If you didn't, don't sign it. I'm like, but I've already told them that we're going to renew the agreement. We're going to sign it next week. Nope, you're not signing it. I'm like, I'm sorry. You you can't just tell me I'm not signing it. You don't have that authority. They just, they flat out told me don't sign it. And I remember just like not knowing what was going on. It was the craziest thing I'd ever seen. And in short, over the next few weeks, it started to trickle out that, you know, there were some financial issues that were really kicking in. And ultimately, you know, we were going to have to go into bankruptcy. And I remember just how, anxious it made everybody in the company and watching your boss on CNN and and Fox News and MSNBC and just not having any control over anything and just really literally waiting to see what was going to happen. And um, I remember feeling powerless and I watched a lot of my colleagues lose their their jobs. Um, We had multiple rounds of layoffs and in particular, one person, they had been there for 22 years and, you know, they had planned on being there until they retired. And uh, that just got pulled from underneath their feet. And I remember that moment of really a moment of clarity for me, because I just realized you cannot depend on a W-2 job. And I thought back to the book about building skills, getting stronger those skills, but then also having other means of income. So you're not solely relying on a W-2 job. And that went from an idea, a great concept in a book to like, oh, crap, like this is what happens when you don't implement this or this could happen. And um, I made it a mission at that point to to seek out how to start investing in real estate. And it took some time. I mean, I was 2009, I think, when I got seriously interested, but Mm -hmm. I don't, we didn't buy our first property until 2012, partially because I was still in Detroit and the market was, you know, rough. And anyone I knew who had real estate was trying to sell it at a fire sale. So it was tough to get in at that point. And I was, you know, new and didn't know what I didn't know. Um, But when I moved to Chicago, that made me um, more comfortable to invest. And I spent the first like, you know, nine months trying to just get the lay of the land, figuring out, you know, what side of town, different neighborhoods, you know, what, what the valuation should be, what should I be getting the rents? And then I was able to finally buy a, a duplex. Oh, okay. And you know, what's so funny because you didn't invest in Detroit because you lived there and you knew what the state of the city was. And I actually invested in Detroit from New York for the first time in like 2012, 2013. So right at the tail end of like when you moved and bought your, your property and that didn't really turn out well. And I think for the reasons that you probably already know, but, um, and that that was with a big group. So we all came together and we picked Detroit because prices were so inexpensive, especially at like tax auctions, but any case. So the other part of what your beginning story that I actually had another question on was, who was this woman? Because you said she, and what was it that she explained to you how she scaled from nine to 90 so quickly? Yeah. So the woman is Bree Schmidt, who was actually my partner for the Midwest Real Estate Networking Summit. Uh, I got to know Bree and she was one of the first investors that I you know, met in person and actually got to know and watch them build their portfolio. So um, I think the key for me was just seeing someone actually grow. Because most people, you go to networking events, right? You go to a meetup, 
you know, uh, and, and no knock, everyone's in the same boat or similar boat, right? So somebody's got a two unit, this person's got a three unit, and a lot of people are kind of starting out. So, and then they don't come back, you know, you go six months or you go straight for three or four months and that person you were talking to, they don't come back or they come like once a year or twice a year and they're not committed. And she was hosting the event. And as the host of the event, she was there every month. So as I showed up pretty much every month, she was there every month. And literally, I mean, there might be a handful of people who are regulars, right? And and obviously she and I were one of them. So we were able to kind of build a relationship to just talk and get to know each other a little bit more. And like I said, over that time, as you talk to somebody for a year and you watch them kind of really scale that portfolio, it opens up your eyes. And there is a comfort level to be able to ask them, hey, you know, would you mind sitting down and and talking to me more about what you did? Um, What she told me was really... uh, something that simple that I think you understand now, but back to me, it was a foreign concept. And it was being able to partner with other people and bring on investors. If you can do that, now you're no longer limited with the capital you have. And at first, I was really hesitant to take that approach. I didn't want to be responsible for other people's money. I didn't want to ask people to invest. I didn't want to be like a salesman. It just wasn't, it just didn't feel good to me. What really changed for me was I realized as I shared my story and journey and thought back to all those people who came to those meetups, but disappeared and never came again. Well, the reason is it's a lot of work. And most people just quite frankly, don't have the time or the energy to commit to the amount of work it takes to find deals, analyze deals, get them under contract, manage those deals and operate. So as I talk to my friends and people who are watching us with our house and our home and other properties, and they're asking questions like, oh, here's how you do it. But, you know, I'm giving them the same game, giving them the same advice, nothing. They do nothing with it. And finally, it just dawned on me that they need an easy way to invest. I mean, we're talking about busy professionals, young parents, young entrepreneurs. You got a lot of responsibilities as it is you know, and and trying to go out there and learn a whole new industry like real estate is complex for a lot of people. And most people just don't have that kind of passion and drive. They don't have the scars that I had, you know, they didn't grow up, you know, with those same scars and they didn't see it all, you know, get threatened from them. And, And to give context to that, I'm a first generation college student, right? Student. I'm, I'm even talking graduate student. So yet alone graduate, yet alone corporate America, white collar job. So when I watched my colleagues losing their jobs, to me, it's like, hey, this is what they told us we had to do to be successful. I've, I've done everything that I was asked to me. I went to school. I got good grades. I graduated, did the internship. I got the career. And these people who look like me are doing the same thing. And now they have no idea how they're going to feed their family. And that was wild to me. And I was like, I didn't come this far just to come this far. So at that point, it was like, we got to figure out another plan. So I realized, you know, everybody doesn't have that. They don't have that baggage and it's fine. But that was my motivation. That was the drive. And finally, I realized that I could help these people in my life by simply finding these opportunities and bringing them alongside me. But in order to do that, I needed to kind of shore up the areas where I was still growing. And that's why mentorship was so key for me and bringing on somebody who could help guide me through that process because I had never raised money for real estate before. Okay. And wow. You know what? And it's, it's like the lady who was uh, Brie, who was heading up that first meetup that you went to that group. She was like an unofficial mentor that kind of just started there and got, got you, gave you the information that you needed to be able to see a different picture and change your frame of reference. And like you said, you were hesitant to that at first, like partnering wasn't something that you were comfortable with. And I think that's a mindset that a lot of people have that they don't want to partner because they shouldn't trust anybody. It's like a trust issue. And then also like being responsible for somebody's money and and all of those things are, I guess, limiting beliefs that keep people from accelerating as fast as they could. But, and it's not like you just go out and partner with anybody. You have to be strategic with it. You have to get to know the person. It's all about relationships. But the fact that you're, you look out for that and you have that open mindset that you're able to, you know, consider partnership as a strategic method to growth, then I think that will help a lot of people um, with whatever their journey is. Um, Okay. So, you started with two units. What does that look like now? Where where are you now? 
Well, I mean, we've partnered with other investors to invest in over a thousand units to date. So we continue to scale that portfolio and our business model has shifted drastically from, you know, when I was just my wife and I just running out and looking for properties and adding it and adding it to our portfolio and buying with our own money to now we partner with other people. So we work with those busy professionals and give them opportunities to look at deals and opportunities that we have and then partner with us. So we don't have, you know, a hundred percent of the deals, but it's better because we can always go out there and look for opportunities and we're not limited by the amount of money we got in our bank account on any given day. So you started in the corporate area and you transitioned into learning about real estate, getting started with real estate, trying to do it on your own. And your mindset got shifted from your unofficial mentor into partnering. And now you've grown your portfolio and scaled to a thousand units partnered with other people, which is that's fantastic. One of the, the things, the premises of the show is to really show people how to grow and protect their money and their capital and to be able to leave a legacy for either their kids or whoever else they want to make an impact on. So how have you set up um, either any equity or net worth or what strategies or vehicles have you used to kind of protect what you've built? Yeah. So I think there are a couple of ways to look at that. So the first part of this is understanding that every investment has risk. It is just you're not going to find a great way to grow your portfolio and grow your income without taking some level of risk. So how do you mitigate those risks? One way to do that is not solely rely on the stock market, um, you know, diversify your investments. The reason we like real estate so much, and in particular commercial apartment buildings, is because they are secured assets. What I mean by secured is they're backed by the building, you know, they're backed by the actual physical property that will always have value. You know, even if a building burned down, the land itself has value. There's insurance policies that you put on these properties to protect yourself. There are things that you can do to make sure you protect those investments themselves. Um, when we invest in these deals, we like cash flowing properties. So I like properties that are already there. They exist the day we buy them. People live in them the day we buy them, and they're already generating a profit. Now, they may not be generating the maximum profit they could generate, but there's enough money coming in to pay all the bills. And if we can buy property like that, and then we come in with a business plan to say, okay, how can we increase profits 15, 20, 25%, whatever that is, that's the way we like to invest because to us, that's how we mitigate those risks, right? We're actually buying an existing business and figuring out how do we increase the operational output. So that is how we, you know, mitigate our risk on the investment side of it. We also like to force appreciation is what we call it. But essentially what we're saying is we don't want to just buy something and hope the market does well for the next five years. We want to buy something with a very specific business plan in mind where we can generate profits and extract more value immediately. And by immediately, I mean within the first year or two, you know, we want to be able to go in and do something. And typically that's going to be like renovating units or, um, you know, changing out maybe some, um, some, some water things. We can reduce the water bill or maybe moving some other utilities around where maybe residents are paying for some of the utilities. So it's stuff like that, that we can go in and boost the, the operational performance. So that's the business of what we do. Now we talk about how do we protect the equity that we've created. Um, you do that a couple different ways. So on the property side of it, you want to make sure that you control the exit. You know, you want to sell when it makes sense for you to sell. Um, and there are different strategies you can employ to do that. But that's one way you approach it. The other thing is, from a personal standpoint, you want to make sure you have the right insurance for yourself, the right life insurance. Um, and you should talk to your advisor so you understand your, your current situation. But as you learn more and more, you'll understand that there are more strategies that are open to you than maybe even your financial advisor is aware of. Um, even your life insurance agent might not be aware of some of these things, or maybe they're just not in a position to offer up some of these products to you. So there are things like that that you can tap into. And then you can also do something that's really cool and easy which is create an LLC to hold all of your assets. That way, as you grow your portfolio or you buy something new or whatever happens, you just put it under that LLC. So, you know, I mean, you got small kids, I got small kids. The worst thing that could happen is, you know, we get wiped out uh, before these kids come of age and really understand what to do. And all of our assets and belongings go into probate. So if you can have a will, 
and make sure that all of your your assets are under an LLC. Well, if that's the case, then as long as that LLC goes to the appropriate heirs, then all of that will be uh, directly, uh, you know, identified correctly, as opposed to you own this piece of property. Um, it's not in the will because you bought it, you know, two months ago, and it wasn't in the will. You didn't update it. And now it's going to go to probate and everyone's going to know that it's there. And, you know, the kids got to, even if it goes directly to the kids, they still have to claim it in court. And then you might have a cousin or an uncle or some other people who, you know, want to ask them for money. And again, I don't know how your family situation is, but, you know, try to protect your family and set them up as much as possible. No, that's great advice. And actually I have been working on even putting that LLC uh, into a trust so that you can avoid probate. That's not a financial advice. Talk to your advisor. <laughs> but yeah, that is an option in a vehicle that I think a lot of people think they have to have, you know, be a multimillionaire in order to employ a trust as a vehicle when you, you really don't have to. Um, OK, so that that's fantastic. Great information so far. If people let's say they decide that being active in real estate, like you said, is a lot of work and it's too much for them to handle and to take on because there is a lot, you know, a lot of education that goes behind that. And a lot of the scars you said you have to go through. Um, how do people get started? Like what is syndication and how do people get started in that? And how do you, what is expected of them if they invest in a property through a syndication? Yeah. I mean, syndication at its simplest level is just group investing, right? It's, it's a group of people that come together you pull your capital together so you can go out and buy a property. Now with syndication, what makes it cool is everyone doesn't have to get together and know everyone. So you have a lead team, which is your general partnership team. And then they have those relationships where they reach out to other investors. They demonstrate what they can do. They have a track record. They show the deal, what their business plan is. And then you decide whether or not you want to invest. So as a limited partner, which is the role you would have as an investor, it's called a limited partner. So as a limited partner, Really, it's turnkey once you decide to invest. The work you have to do as a limited partner is up front. You want to make sure you understand who the general partnership team is. So who are you working with? What's their experience? What's their track record? How comfortable do you feel with them? Um, you know, how aggressive or conservative are they when they're looking at opportunities? Just really get a sense of who they are and how they operate. Um, once you have to understand, once you understand that, the next thing is to understand the markets. So what market is the property in? What's going on in that market? You mentioned Detroit. Um, Detroit has, you know, um, it, it could be whatever you want it to be. It, for me, it doesn't work as a market because our market criteria is pretty set. But there are people who are crushing Detroit at the time you bought, you know, and if I would have if I would have waited out another year or two, it would have been a great time to buy in Detroit. You know, 2011, 2012, 2013, it was a great time to buy but you had to have the right business plan. And if you don't have the right business plan, it doesn't matter. <laughs> like it doesn't matter where you buy because uh, you can have a, a bad market and a great business plan. If you execute, you can do extremely well, but you have to understand the market dynamics. You know, you can't, you can't um, go invest in a city like Detroit, just like it's LA and expect to get the same results. You have to have nuances to your approach and put the plan together based on that market. So um, so those are the things you're looking at to understand the market. And then finally, you want to make sure that you understand the deal and you want to understand where the business plan is, what, what are the concerns you have, how could the deal go wrong? And that's a question I would ask, hey, what could go wrong in this deal? You know, what are some some serious things that you're going to have to mitigate? And that'll give you a better sense of you know, whether or not it's the right opportunity for you. The last thing I will say is just make sure you know what your investing goal is. You know, these deals are typically a three to seven year hold period. So it's not going to be a get in and get out kind of situation. Um, if you want to get your money back in six to 12 months, I would highly advise against investing in a real estate syndication. They're, they're, they're liquid assets. They do take some time for the market to come around. Um, so it just, it takes something that's a bit more patient, but if you're looking at long-term wealth, long-term wealth creation, then these are great vehicles. Like you said earlier in the show, you get cash flow, appreciation potential, you get to leverage with the debt, uh, you get some phenomenal tax benefits. There are a lot of things that make this really attractive for everyday professionals, particularly if you know that real estate can work for you, but you just don't have the time to go out there and try to find and manage your own deals. Yeah, that's perfect. That's great advice. So basically, 
wrapping that up, if you want to be passive because you can't, you know, you don't have the time or energy or commitment to do it on the active side, you just need to, you need to vet your operators, make sure they're, they're good. You have to vet the market, make sure you agree with what's happening in that market. And then you have to know your own investing criteria. What are you looking to achieve in the time frame? So creating that plan and just when you're networking and meeting with people, you can get a feel and, and ask people, you know, about, investing criteria. You can see what other people's investing criteria and kind of help you formulate your own if you don't really know right now. Wait, wait, don't go yet. Have you been looking for a way to get started in real estate investing, but you just don't know how? You need the Launchpad. It's brought to you by my company, Norvest Holdings. And the Launchpad is a free guide with a ton of resources I've compiled to help you invest into your first real estate syndication. It includes terminology, book resources, video explanations, all the information that you need. Don't know what a syndication is? I got you covered. How to find a good operator. How to even tell if a deal is good or not without having to know how to underwrite it all. It's all in there. The Launchpad is designed to help launch you into the next stage of your investing career and get you invested into your first multifamily syndication as a passive investor, meaning you can be a landlord and own a piece of a large apartment building, but still go about your day-to-day life without having to stop and learn every single detail about what's under the hood and how it all works. The link to the guide is in the show notes. Make sure you sign up today. Again, this is a free resource and guide. And if you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out to me. Now let's finish up the show. So we are going to actually, we're leading into our our final two. Um, I don't have a name for it yet. I've said that before. I need to come up with, you know, something snazzy for my final two questions. (laughs) But anyway, so the first one is, um, Warren Buffett said that diversification is a protection against ignorance. I kind of take that to mean that basically People diversify because they don't know what they're doing. So they just try to put a little bit in everything. But what's your take on that? Well, I mean, I I get the point of it. I guess the thing is, is you can't be an expert at everything. And even if you're an expert in, let's say, multifamily investing, you don't get to control uh, things like the interest rates or economy or wars or, uh, you know, pandemics. So I think diversification is a way to spread out risk. Um, If you are absolutely trying to make the best return possible, your best bet is to put everything in one basket and watch that one basket. But I think for most people, the better strategy is to diversify. That way you have some flexibility in case the market does take a shift. Nice. Love it. Second question. You've played Boardwalk before? I mean, Boardwalk. Have you played Monopoly before? (laughs) Oh, I was like, Boardwalk, is that like the new version of Monopoly? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I, I play Monopoly all the time. Okay. So in your Monopoly win the game, take all strategy, Boardwalk or Baltic Avenue? Oh, Boardwalk. Why? Baltic, I got a thing. Baltic is the second purple one, right? Mediterranean is the first one. Baltic. Yeah. Like one, right? So it's one okay. of the, the, they're both the two cheap. It's one of the first. Yeah. yeah so, um, well, really is neither, but you didn't ask me that. So, uh, but to answer your question, you only have to be r- right a couple of times for on boardwalk to, to win you. I mean, you got to hit Baltic, you know, you got to hit that thing probably 10 times to, to get the same returns you would get on boardwalk, even though the cost is much higher. Um, now, what I would tell you is actually that's that's not the strategy I use. And if I ever play you in Monopoly, don't use my skills, my what I'm telling you against me. But um, <laughs> I actually I actually like to shoot for that second row. So the the first row is like the purple and the light blue, and then the yeah. second row is the orange and the um, yellow. I think I don't know wherever St. Charles Place is. Yeah, and the uh, the other orange so the, one. The same the same row as the orange ones. Yes. That's my row. Okay. okay. Because that is, and that's my class, my B class properties for, for my, for the listeners here, right? That's like C plus B minus properties. But the thing is, is like, there's a great balance of cash flow and appreciation potential on those. Row. I wouldn't talk like this as a seven-year-old plan, but, but as a, you know, a mature man, that's what I, that's the way I look at it. But, uh, but it's a great balance of cash flow, you know, and then people hit it often, right? You get to that, that free parking, you know, the chance cars start to kick in and people get to skip over your properties and all of that. But that second row, you pretty much can't avoid it. 
So it's better cash returns. If you could own that row, you can do really well there. All right. You know what? You're the first one to actually go in more depth to your actual oh, strategy I'm, for Anomaly. Monopoly. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So now I'm going to take that. I need to play my husband or somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and, and on the corner the best thing is that corner if you could get the orange and the red where kentucky and uh the red the red ones are yeah only red and then the the orange ones right there right around the free space psh, yeah that free parking you can you can clean up and you've actually invested in kentucky too right i did yeah the steak of the kentucky. Had nothing to do with monopoly though but yes <laughs> <laughs> all correlated i feel like okay this was great. Thank you so much, John. Um, how can listeners get in touch with you if they wanted to reach out, learn more? Like, I know you you actually help with active investing people who want to learn that. And then you also offer opportunities for passive investing, too. So no matter what side of the coin people are on, they could reach out to you for either, right? Absolutely. So I think the, the easiest thing is this. Uh, if you got value out of this show, first of all, leave Nicole a rating and review. I'm sure she'd love it. Be sure to subscribe to this show. Uh, two ways to reach out to me. One, check out my show. It's called Multifamily Insights. It's available anywhere you listen to podcasts. We are 400 episodes strong or just about 400 episodes strong by the time this comes out. Uh, so super excited for that. And then the second is we actually have a free sample deal package available. So if you want to be active, you want to be passive, but you want to understand like, hey, what should I be looking at? You know, what are some of these terms? What should I be conveying to people? What do I need to understand? Check out the sample deal package. It's a great way to start getting your head around what you should be thinking about when you're looking at a deal or looking at an opportunity. And I think it's very helpful. We break down in some follow-up emails to give you a sense of, hey, here are the things that are really important that you want to look at so you can start getting more comfortable with it. I just think it's better doing it that way than when you have a real live opportunity, but you don't know the questions that you should have asked earlier in the process. So check out the sample deal. You can get that at chasmincapital.com slash sample deal. Nice. Thank you. And John is so modest. His multifamily insights is like a mega superstar in the podcasting world. <laughs> Super modest. So thank you for being on here with me today. I really appreciate it. And I know you left so many gems for the listeners and everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we will see you next time. Did you love this episode of Share the Wealth Show? Be sure to connect with Nicole by following her on LinkedIn, Instagram, or Facebook. If you picked up any of the gems that were dropped by today's guest, make sure you not only put them in your bag, but if you know of someone who would benefit from this information, don't keep it to yourself. Share the wealth and make sure to leave us a rating and review. We'll see you for next week's episode. Subscribe so you'll be notified.